Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to pick up where I left off in my last video talking about CentOS streams right after this. So yeah, last time I yeah <laughs> we had the uh, we had the uh, thrashing problem. So I did uh, I did try a couple of things uh, over the past couple of days to see if this occurred just because I chose server GUI or would it happen if I just chose the server uh, by itself with just a text you know uh, CLI client. No, it still happens. So even with eight gig. Uh, I still went to 95%, so it could be there's a memory leak in the installer, or there's something going on here that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, but in any event, we'll go. It, it is installed, and it's I'm, I'm running with four cores and eight gig, just like I was last time. So let's. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is cockpit. Now, Cockpit is not a configuration manager. It is a tool to help you administer your system. So it doesn't create templates that you can then just deploy to other servers. Uh, but it does allow you to have a graphical user interface to go in and modify things within your systems. It, and you may think that that's a tool that was done by Red Hat. No, it's not. So let me show you. There is a Cockpit project that's out at cockpit-project.org, and I'll put the links in the show notes uh, for today's episodes. And <clears throat> Cockpit uh, is is actually, uh, well, here, let's, uh, let's just look what it's actually installed for. So first of all, you can use uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, or Mozilla Firefox, and uh, they also give you the minimum versions of each of those, and of course they recommend you <laughs> that you use the, the uh, most current. But it isn't just for Red Hat or Fedora or Core, Atomic of course now is Silverblue, but, or CentOS, but it also is supported by Debian and Ubuntu. So yeah, th those are the supported releases. There is a bundle, and there's some instructions here about where to find it for clear Linux. There's, it's also available on Arch and Tumbleweed, although you'll notice they have not been tested, and so therefore not supported. But uh, I don't know if they run or not. <clears throat> I have not tried it under clear Linux or, or even Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, but so it is, it is available for a number of distributions, so it's not just a Red Hat package. Uh, there's uh, documentation on the site to help you kind of get started. Now, first, I think the, f the first question somebody asked me in the last video is, would I recommend Cockpit to run uh, from the Internet remotely? No. I never recommend that you ever put any kind of administrative tool on the outside of your firewall. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I would recommend instead that you use some method of... Um, you know, either a VPN access where you're secured and tunneling through your firewall and into your uh, systems area before you allow cockpit to be accessed from the internet. Um, yeah, you, I mean, there are some strong ways you can set up the, the security on the system. It does support TLS and SSL. Uh, but, you know, you, you have a system here that is working in privilege mode. And that's playing with fire. Anytime you have a privilege mode application that allows you to make changes ad hoc to your system as root, <laughs> that's not a good thing that you would want to have available to the Internet. So personally, no, I wouldn't recommend direct access from the Internet. But if you access it through a tunnel or through VPN uh, or some other method like that, great. Or some RSA approved method for accessing it across your firewall in a secure encrypted manner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can absolutely do that. But it goes through and it, it gives you some information on here's the, the man pages. You can, there is a default con con configuration that it comes with and there's a default set of integration tools that you can have. Uh, also, there's some information about <clears throat> within it on how you can customize it for the specific types of applications that you have. I'm not going to get into that today. That's, uh, I mean, that 
you will know yeah you will have to know json i will tell you that in order for you to be able to configure this but uh yeah um so i guess you know i guess the first steps are what we can go through this and there's some things here now they talk about docker but CentOS is going to be more focused on podman than docker uh, so let's go over here and I've, I've i've got my system up as i had left it last time except i did make one change I did put this uh, on a fixed IP, and the reason I do that is because I want to show you NFS, and <clears throat> my NFS server requires you to be part of my network, so if you're not part of my network, it isn't going to let you have amount access. So anyway, I had to actually configure this as part of the network to do that. So um, let's see. Looks like it picked up, it picked up my host name just fine from the DNS, so it, when it installed, this time around it actually configured it. But I'll show you with uh, Cockpit how you can do all this. So to enable it, I have to do a system control enable. I'm gonna do now and, uh, oops. And that's all you need to do, um, other than, of course, enter your sudo password in order to do it. And then we can check to see what the status of it is. <clears throat> and it is listening. So the port that this listens on is 9090. So I'm, I'm just going to use my Firefox browser out here. And of course, it's going to. This is using a self-signed certificate. You, there is information and uh, documentation on their site to allow you to set up a a, a real certificate. And of course, you would probably want to do that unless you constantly wanted to override this, which is not really, not really the best thing you can do. So, so the first thing we're done once we get through all this is that we are greeted with this. Now, I'm going to sign on. I created a user ID, as you recall, when I uh, set up this system initially. And if you didn't, uh, go back and look at the other video. And I gave it admin privileges. So, so I'm I'm in I'm into the system, and right now, this is the default look and feel for the system. So the first thing we're going to want to do here is we'll want to replay, uh, fail to obtain authentication. Hmm. I may have to actually be under root. So let's, let's go ahead. Let me log out here. I noticed it did ask me if I wanted to be. So let's, let's go back in as root. Okay, now, cannot update read-only repo. Hmm. So apparently there, are, well, why is that? That shouldn't be. So anyway, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Let me log out and we'll do the update first from over here. Oops. I thought that might work, so I just thought I would try it. That is an older version of Cockpit, and of course this will update it <clears throat> to the latest version of it. It was kind of interesting, it showed local.local .local domain on this. But yeah, out here it knows it's the right server. Hmm. Interesting. Might have been one of the bugs they fixed. We'll see when we get in this time what's going on. I'll be back when this is done. That's going to take a while. Okay, so it's all done. I'm going to go ahead and reboot. Go ahead and 
put the scaling back on. We'll just check if it is still up. And it is, okay. So let's see if we get a little bit different look here. Yep, I already can see that it is. I'm gonna go ahead and just use root. Yeah, it's quite a bit different. So yeah, this is the, the later one. So you'll notice right away that this is wrong. So the first thing I probably want to do here is fix that. Let's sit down here in networking. No. This should let me fix that. There it is. Okay. Okay, so let's let's just go see if this now works. Yeah, it's working now. So you can turn on automatic, you can check for updates, and it shouldn't give us a, a big problem this time. I think there was some bugs in the early one. So you can turn on automatic updates if you want to. But let's just go through it. So the first thing you get on the overview page is, is kind of an overview of your system and some system information. You can also, now this, this is KVM, and KVM will look down through the actual hardware that's attached to the system. So this is not virtualized hardware. This is actual hardware that is on my system. Now, this, with the exception of the bridge, because that... That isn't obviously a Natoma Triton, um, but uh, those are the those are the ones that are virtualized, and so is that. But if you look here, my mass storage controller is also is yeah, that's right. Well, maybe this is virtualized. Yeah, it is virtualized. So <clears throat> yeah, okay. So that definitely is virtualized. We can set our time manually, or I can set it to using NTP. I can also set it using Crony, but that is a different place to go to do that. So uh, I, this domain, I think, is for a Windows domain? No, this is an LDAP. Yeah, OU, that'd be LDAP. So I can look at my secure keys. This is C PCP, and I'll have to install that. Uh, now, when I did this earlier, it shows the option to collect the reports, but nothing happens. So I'm not sure if it has to go through a day cycle and then it produces the reports at night, similar to the way the old uh, uh, systems accounting uh, used to work, that it doesn't actually do anything until the crons run uh, during the day or during the night whenever the cron job is set to kick them off. But well, I'll come back and I'll talk about this maybe a day from now. We'll see if it actually produced anything. But it will it will not even allow me to look at them. Um, but it will let me set them up. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I see the store metrics. I can click it on, and nothing happens. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything that's actually being stored yet. So I can also look at the system logs, and I can look at different levels. I can look at everything if I want, and then it shows me where I have warnings or errors, problems, whatever. Uh, I can also I can look at it by specific type of application that's running uh, and pick whatever one that I want to see specific information on. Uh, storage. So this one will actually show you what's going on I.O.-wise. Uh, it allows you to see what your storage locations are. 
Uh, and you can also set up NFS mounts. You can also, if this is the, if you have iSCSI set up in your, uh, in your particular installation, you can set up <clears throat> the portal for those. And I don't, I don't have iSCSI, so I can't show you, but I do have this. Let's see if I can get this to work. Now it should find, it did, it found it. So I'm gonna go ahead and I don't have this directory created. So what it should do, yeah, it should automatically create the directory and it set it up so that it will remount it on the next boot. So I now have a, a NAS uh, installed here and we can validate that. It's right here, uh, that it has actually mounted it. So it actually works. Um, networking, I can, again, same thing, I can watch my receiving and sending packets. I can, sh if I have uh, my firewall set up, <clears throat> mine is blank, so I don't have much on it. And it'll show you the zones. There's also the bridges, and then any logs that Network Manager is producing would be here. Podman containers is CentOS and Red Hat's replacement for Docker. Uh, and... Um, so I can, now I'm under a VM, so this is probably not the smartest thing to do, but I can go ahead and start it. And then I could go ahead and get a new image if I wanted to. Let's see. And you start to type and then it'll, it'll produce some um, suggestions so we can pick that one and it's pulling it and there's my container up and running and then I could start it and get my results if I want to so yeah very it's very straightforward it's not really too difficult uh, I can go in and <clears throat> create new new accounts if I want or I can modify existing ones uh, if they're online, which th this one is, it knows it, and I can terminate my session over here that's on. Uh, also, I can change, uh, you know, my password, or I can lock the account out. The, this is kind of nice, is that you can actually assign uh, SSH keys to the login, so that it, if I have a match on my client side, then it, it would allow me to log in without having to uh, give it provide a password, which is nice. It gives you a services view and you can look at all of the running. Now, one of the things that I would like to see is a sort here on the state because, I mean, alphabetical order is really nice, but as you can see, there's quite a length of them here and it'd be nice. Now, I know I can filter it. Uh, I can also go here by enabled, disabled, and break it down that way. So yeah, I guess that's all right. Uh, but I'm, I'm just used to, you know, some of the other uh, controls. Oops. I meant to show you that on one that was actually running. Let's go down and find SSH here. Okay. That's SSD. Go down just a little bit further. I must have gone by it. There it is. So yeah, here you can you can reload it, restart it, stop it, mask it out if you want. Uh, again, same thing. You can see the logs for that service if you want to look at those. Um, and then you have some applications here. That so the services that's yeah, pretty straightforward. I mean, I, it's not a big deal there. So if you're so you have some things here, like I can, this is the Podman container that we were just in up here. And the storage one is also one that's optional to install. So if you don't want that, you can remove it. And if you don't want Podman, you can remove it too. Uh, if you want to manage virtual machines, I'm going to go ahead and install that. Even though I am under a VM, KVM will allow you to do that. Uh, and then you'll see the menu sh shows up right here. So this is the preferred way now uh, over uh, Vert Manager to manage KVM. Okay, let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. So I can, let's see what we can do here. We can download an OS. Ah, 
local install media URL okay and then you can choose the operating system kind of the typical ones that you always see uh, and then how much how much disk you want to allocate it and then how much memory and then start uh, I might come back and, and actually run through this once I become more familiar with this uh, it looks pretty basic to me um, I you know I don't know if there's a uh, another way you can do, add let's see I have one network because that's all I configured in the VM and I don't have any storage pools assigned to this yet so let's go back to the applications uh, also um, this would be for Red Hat I think Candle pin back in, yeah, Red Hat, right. So if you had a subscription to uh, RHEL, uh, you can bring in those rep repos if you want. Now this one gathers information about the system and allows you to download a tarball. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And We'll just wait for that to generate. So I guess if you're working with developers or you're working with the kernel people, uh, if you are having issues with the system and you wanted to provide them with as much data as possible, uh, you could do that. Um, but you know they do have this warning about passing it to a third party. It probably would be more useful to them. Uh, I mean, I've looked at some of it. It's mostly. Uh, it's mostly the configuration files and your log files that are being collected. So I can download the report and it'll just let's open it up in Archive Manager so we can actually see what it looks like. So yeah, you can see it, it, it has your boot, your grub, your loader, your all of your configuration at Etsy. It's basically kind of a dump. It, your your state. I don't know if this is pop. Yeah, it is. So your proc file, your root. So yeah, you probably wouldn't want to give this to just anybody. And then these are links. Let's see. Is home in here too? No. Ah. Okay. Yeah, so it, yeah, <laughs> it's basically everything in your system is in that, that thing. Um, you, can, you, can, uh, you can test the configuration on a crash dump by actually crashing the system. Uh, and then if you had, you wanted to check to see um, your automation scripts and how they're doing for SE Linux and your policies. We looked at this, and this is the reason why I wouldn't want to put this on the outside of the internet. <laughs> it's because with one click, I, I, if I'm logged in as root, I have your, I'm root. Uh, and then, of course, I can change my, my pat, my, I think, I don't know, dark, dark's blue, okay. So, that's basically it for cockpit. Uh, they, I, let's see what's going on here. We've got some socket problems. Ah, this. Let's go ahead and just restart it. I don't know why that crashed, but it did. Result trigger limit hit. Refusing further activate. Ah, it requires some activation. Okay, so, um, yeah, I don't really have much more to say about that. Let's, uh, let me go ahead and log out of this. And we'll go back over here and play around with some stuff. So, you know, that I like to, uh, uh, so as far as the server utilities, not a lot that comes with it. Boxes is on here. Of course, that's known boxes in your settings. Uh, probably. Probably got to do what I usually do and give myself a little bit more room, since that's pretty small. Let's see. Let me do 1490. Yep. There we go. And 
Yeah, it's a little better. Let's see what else we got here. I think this is flat pack, but let's just check that. Nope. No, it's not. Not a lot in here, but then, you know, on a, this, the, this is the server. <laughs> you, probably, you probably wouldn't expect a lot. Um, I'm pretty sure you have to follow the same directions as you normally would to enable... Uh, the flat pack by going to the flat hub site and then picking up the install file and let's see so the other thing I want to know is top is here I'm sure H top probably is not Neo fetch is not plants this is not oh wait I didn't check if get was there or not it probably is oops Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to find uh, third party applications without installing the uh, EPL. Now to find them. <clears throat> so we have 161 tasks running, 393 threads, two of which are running. 1.6 gigabyte of memory out of the eight running under GNOME, yeah, uh, wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, let's see. It's probably 1800, I'm going to guess. No, 1300 RPMs installed. Again, it doesn't matter. What matters is this. It's, uh, it's taking 4.8 gig of disk. Now, of course, that would be a lot less if I didn't install the server GUI. Uh, actually, you know, it's kind of funny. If you look at uh, the Red Hat documentation, they actually suggest you don't install the server GUI. And, and in all honesty, for installing a server, yeah, you don't really want the overhead of a GUI on your system anyway. Uh, you want, because there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I don't, I don't have the kernel sources, but if I downloaded them, I bet I would find the default configuration is not set up like a workstation. I bet it's set up for uh, round robin time slicing. So, and that's not the best to have for uh, a, uh, a, a desktop environment. So uh, let's see, uh, let's go do glances. Oops. Glances showing 1.92 gig with the app caches. And yeah, not using any swap, although there's 3.2 gig that is enabled. So it has not used any since the last reboot. But then again, I haven't run through this. Now I did notice the same kind of issues I saw when I was doing the install during the, when it was doing KMOD and when it was building the kernel. Uh, for the installation that, yeah, memory use went up to almost, I think it was close to about 6 gig. 
6.2, 6.3 gig out of the 8 that was configured. There's something going on there. I know compilers sometimes are configured to use all available memory just to speed things up, but they may have went one step too far <laughs> with that one. So anyway. Um, uh, let's go over to opt. I owe you guys a, a video on hardening, and I'm working on that, so. Okay. Wonder what surprises they'll have. I haven't run this in a week or two. So I wonder what surprises they've added this time. <laughs> I didn't see the, I didn't see system D come back out. I wonder if they pulled that. We'll go through, I'll page back up here when this is done. <clears throat> oh, that's new. They've broken out into insecure services. Sixty-three. Yeah, uh, and I'll bet most of it is probably. We probably have some warnings. Nope. Yeah, we do. Reba is mostly like. And of course, that that promiscuous interface is giving it heartache. You know what? What happened with the system D? Did they pull that out? Looks like it. It probably were causing a lot of people a lot of heartburn with that one. Um, System D is not the easiest thing to secure. Um, let's see, configuration default. So, which is true. I haven't done anything to, to do anything with it. I uh, wonder if that's because of some of the some of the things that I was doing. Um, as far as you know, using this as a server, I guess I should. It's, I think this is 418. Yep, 418, 193. That's a little newer than what my slide had showed. I think I showed 147. So, yeah, that's been updated. That's the April 23rd build. Oh, it's OS release. Yeah. Um, based on RHEL, and Fed looks like Fedora and RHEL. Version 8. Interesting. I guess they had to give it some version to be the base, even though it's a rolling release. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I mean, everything else is pretty much the same. I, I just wanted to show Cockpit. Now, that version of Cockpit is the same that's on Fedora. So I don't know, I guess if you, I don't know what package managers. It's .org, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, I just was curious as to see. I don't know what version these have. And it's coming from the back ports for Debian 9. It's probably 9 or greater. Um, say it's 1604 for you, Ubuntu, or greater, or later. Actually, they're saying it's included in 1704, and it's in the back port for 1604. 
There's the bundle for Claire Lennox. It's in the Pac-Man. Tumbleweed is part of Zyper. Yeah, of course, Project Atomic is Silver Blue. I, I haven't played with that very much, uh, although that looks like it's more useful for servers uh, when you're deploying into cloud environments, so it's not probably something that I will cover. Um, So I guess some final thoughts. I mean, uh, sent the rolling releases in server products, those would probably be okay for developers to be using, but I would not want to put a rolling release into production. Uh, there are several problems with that, as I've mentioned before in the past. The, uh, the first problem is, is, of course, if you're changing the kernel and you do have to go through security audits, either because you're HIPAA compliant or whether you're one, you're using either the PCI DSS standard that you have to meet, and you're certifying to that, which of course is uh, is for websites that are that are uh, taking money through credit cards. But uh, the other one might be, of course, government, and government would never allow uh, a rolling release uh, simply because they, you can't you can't certify it, you can't control it. Uh, and so you don't know if a new if a new version of the kernel would be to over be overlaid or packages that were critical to the function of the system that were uh, updates other than security releases they would not allow. So in a commercial uh, in a commercial setting, I would be hesitant to use a rolling release as well. But if I was in development and I and I was deploying to the cloud. And I knew that um, the systems that I was going to deploy were several months out. I'm, I might not hesitate to do that. But of course, if I was, if I'm in, uh, if I'm in certified environments, I'd be more inclined to go with 8.2, uh, simply because it's, it's, you know, you can lock it down. You know that, you know, one of the, one of the nice things with package managers uh, like RPM and also Deb. Uh, and I think Pac-Man as well is that you can trigger those to only provide security updates. So you can, you can ignore the rest of the uh, updates to the system and only install those things that require security updates. Now it does, we used to do some custom scripting around that uh, back in the old days, but I think that has improved quite a bit uh, because you do have, you know, you, you do have a lot of the auto update features allow for that. So anyway, that's the, that's the thing that I wanted to talk about today. Um, and to kind of finish this up, mm, not quite sure what's going on with the memory problems here. Uh, this is new. I'm going to start watching them on some of the other distributions that I, I cover and see if I have this similar type of thing that's going on. Uh, although this is, you know, Red Hat use, does their own thing with uh, the installer. That, of course, is a, a, Anaconda. And Anaconda has not been the best thing to use for installations over the years, as probably many of you old-timers know. So with that, I hope to see you again real soon. Please like and subscribe, and bye for now.